So, uh, thanks, Lisa, and thanks uh, for allowing me the opportunity to share some of my uh, thoughts and bring some of this uh, Dutch energy uh, to Vancouver. Um, I have to say, seeing everyone else's photos from Amsterdam kind of got me a little bit nostalgic. Uh, I lived there uh, for just over a year, and I moved to Vancouver a couple months ago. Um, and uh, so here's my, my little bit about uh, the bringing Dutch uh, cycling infrastructure and enthusiasm to, to Vancouver. So when I got here, this is the image that I saw of cycling in Vancouver. I call this the dream because those are all renderings and photos. They're not real people. Uh, it's a lot of very relaxed women, right, riding carelessly, the wind in their hair. Uh, life is great. Except, again, they're not real photos, not to mention that they're actually criminals for not wearing their helmets. <laughs> um, and really, the reality is quite a bit different. Um, a lot more spandex, a lot less women, uh, a lot of cyclists that are a little bit um, stressed out with cars all around them, having to navigate cars that are parked, cars that are moving, cars that are moving in and out. Uh, but I do have to say, I think especially on the dedicated bike lanes, you do see increasingly more uh, cyclists that are relaxed, uh, and that's, I think, moving in the, the right, right direction. And I think um, there's something to be said about that, and that makes it um, enjoyable to be here. Um, so how do we narrow that gap between the reality and the, uh, and, and the image. How do we make the reality uh, be the image? And I think many of you are familiar with this, uh, with this information. It came out of Portland, but there's a lot of similarities between Vancouver and Portland. And I think it's fair to assume that the demographics are also quite similar. So I don't want to focus too much on the strong and the fearless and the, the no way, no how right now. Let's ignore those two categories for the moment and look at the enthused and confident and the interested but concerned. And I think everyone will agree that our goal here is to try to grow the piece of the pie that is enthused and confident to include the interested and concerned. So how do we move the interested and concerned into the enthused and confident? Um, and to do that, you have to first think about who are the interested and concerned, why are they interested but concerned, and how do we get them enthused and confident? And, um, I think you'll agree that very often it's women, um, so maybe your, your wives, your girlfriends, uh, mothers with their children, uh, parents in general, children in general, and maybe also older people, right? So um, how do we, again, make, uh, make them all enthused and confident? And this brings me to the photos from around the world part, um, because in Amsterdam, as I think we've already seen, the enthused and confident is the 66% of the two-thirds of the population. So. We've seen already some photos of uh, chicks on bikes, right? These are not staged. They're just getting to where they need to go, right? Uh, and they're not criminals either, right? They're just safe and they're confident and, um, and they're also gorgeous, right? Because my, my hypothesis when I got to Amsterdam was that bikes makes you sexy, right? And uh, of course, I'm joking, but uh, it's, it's well, I think in the end it's not a coincidence that you've got a lot of beautiful, uh, healthy, happy people and 58% of trips in the city are on bikes, uh, inner city that is. So uh, kids on bikes and mothers on bikes and fathers on bikes, right? They also need to be safe. Um, so how, how do we get there, right? And I think we've seen a lot of examples of how infrastructure can, um, can help with that. And everyone else on bikes, right? So here you see a couple of older ladies on bikes. And, and what I like about this photo is that bike friendly doesn't have to mean car free. So you see cars, but I can tell you those cars are not moving at 80 kilometers an hour, right? I can tell you that they're moving at a slower speed. I can tell you they're respectful of cyclists because for the most part, even if you're a motorist, you're also a cyclist at some point, so you have a respect for cyclists, even if you're not a cyclist at this certain point in time. And then everyone else also on bikes. Okay, so inevitably when I have this conversation with people in Vancouver, as I have for the last couple of months, people say, well, aren't the Dutch different? Haven't they always been bike friendly? Uh, and the answer is only partially so, because here is an example of a street in the 1950s. Uh, you've got the cars parked on the left-hand side and the cars moving. The exact same street nowadays is for pedestrians and cyclists only. Okay, so to answer your question, how do you, how do you deal with this? Uh, unfortunately, you can get something for nothing. The only way to do it is to eventually take some space away from cars. This is maybe the bad news, but it doesn't have to be. Okay, here's another example. How many of you have been to a bike, you know, by the way? Obviously some. 
How many of you have been to Newmark? Okay. Newmark in the center of town. Um, if you go to Amsterdam, a lot of people end up there. It's a very lively place. Most tourists will have no idea that this used to be a car-centric place. Most Dutch people themselves don't even know that this used to be used as a parking lot. And this right now is an extremely lively area, very vibrant, very human friendly, bikes and pedestrians everywhere, uh, tons of pubs and restaurants. Um, and again, it's just impossible to imagine that in the 70s and in the 80s it was, it was used as a parking lot. Okay? Uh, and uh, the last myth that I want to debunk for you tonight, because again, inevitably everyone says, well, but even if... Amsterdam was car-centric at one point in time, it was still built for people, it's an old town, and, and meanwhile, Vancouver, you know, it's a, it's a new city, it's a North American city, it's built for, it's built for cars, and, and that's not totally true either, because here is Vancouver in 1906, uh, and it was a city built for streetcars, and horses, and buggies, and people, and, uh, and, and bicycles, uh, and uh, we have to make a decision which elements of this do we want to keep and which ones we want to dump, right? Um, so to wrap it all up, uh, I think as Canadians we like to pride ourselves on um, the Canadian culture of diversity and tolerance, right? So if we're going to live to that, then why would we not also uh, be tolerant and respect diversity on the road? So there should be a place for cars and pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, and I'm not talking about vehicular cyclists here, by the way. I mean a designated space for each one of these groups and respect for each one of these groups. Right? Uh, and to get there, I think we've heard a lot about the hard infrastructure, the bike lanes, the parking that is needed, the signals. Uh, and again, um, it's impossible to do it without taking some space away from cars, I believe. Uh, and then the soft, the soft part, the soft knowledge, uh, cycling education for everyone. Right? So adults, definitely. Kids, it, again, it's not accidental that kids uh, and adults cycle in Amsterdam and the Netherlands the way they do. Uh, they take uh, cycling, is, in, is, is, in the, is implemented in their education. Uh, in elementary school, at the age of 12, they have to pass an exam to cycle the way um, teenagers pass a motorist or, or, or license um, exam to be able to drive when they're 16, I believe in. In BC. So exactly the same concept except apply to cycling uh, and they become independent with the uh, And I can tell you that that has a lot to do with the way you end up with a society that's much more independent, uh, much more free, and uh, much more mature because they have this independence and because they're able to get places at a young age. Uh, and uh, again, motorists, um, I'm wrapping it up right now. Um, I've noticed uh, the motorists don't exactly respect cyclists here, right? So I don't know if Hub maybe needs to have a bike once a, once a week day. I don't know if maybe that would help to try to get people out of their cars just once a week to really kind of show motorists that once you're a cyclist, you act a little bit differently and then you take that awareness with you when you go back to being a motorist. Uh, and I think that's needed um, along with education for everyone else, as I mentioned. So. I'll leave it at that, um, but uh, definitely chat with me more later if uh, I'm always interested to chat more about cycling here and in Amsterdam and everywhere else. That's how you can get a hold of me. Thanks, guys. Thank you. So any questions for this brand new uh, person to Vancouver with all her Dutch and Amsterdam knowledge? Somebody, um, yeah. It up on most of her glass. Um, people are not wearing helmets. They don't. <laughs> is, that, is that a problem there? Or could that be, you know, can we introduce that to you? Or is that a problem? Yeah, I don't think we're quite there yet, right? <coughs> so uh, when you have an intersection where motorists and cyclists have to interact, it's a lot less safe than um, the Dutch style intersections, which separate cyclists and motorists much more thoroughly. So, um, I mean, this is an on, on, ongoing discussion about the helmet law. We can chat more about it later. Um, we're definitely not where Amsterdam is at. I'm not sure that the helmet situation is exactly the most relevant discussion at this point. Um, I'm not sure I'm really answering your question, but those are just my thoughts. <laughs> the helmet one is a long... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so 
would be great to talk to Cornelia and other people. Uh, well, the short answer is that people don't wear them. Period. That's the short answer. And all everywhere except here. In Australia, but they even recognize that they've done it not so well. So I don't think we want to be on that side of the crisis. I'm just curious, what is the size of the suburbs in Amsterdam compared to Vancouver? Because you have a lot of people from, say, out in Surrey or Langley or far away that drive to Vancouver to work. Because it is a long distance, I'm wondering what the size. Of yeah, that's it's, and you're right. That's a very um, significant difference. Uh, you have a lot of people commuting into Amsterdam, for example, but they would be commuting primarily by train. Uh, so the layout and the urban form is is a huge difference. I would say the number one difference between the two places, and that's why I think uh, Vancouver, uh, you know, I think has the right condition to create a cycling friendly place in Vancouver, and doing so for the metro region I think is a lot tougher. Uh, but again, this is also cultural where people have to decide, well, why am I living in one place and working 40 kilometers away? But the average commute in the, in the lower mainland is 8 kilometers. And for that, you should be able to bike. That's an easy bike. Yes. Easy. I think there's time for one last question. Sarah, I think you had one. Um, I just am curious about your opinion. This is something that I'm really curious, like interested in myself. Is you know you're talking about you know like hard infrastructure investments and like you know making sort of like systemic changes in terms of education. But what I what obviously is a big challenge is in order to do those things, you need sort of like a kind of like societal like approval of these changes, right? Because those things cost money, they take resources and things like that. Do you sort of have any kind of, I know we don't really, I can talk to you about this after. <laughs> 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 but, okay, I like, I like where it's going. I think if I can just quickly comment on that, um, and I think Arno already touched on this idea. In the 70s there was a tipping point in the Netherlands, and it was hundreds of people in the streets saying um, that cars kill children and the environment. Uh, and that they wanted to bring that to city for bikes. Uh, and I do think we need to kind of get to that point in, in Canada or Vancouver or UBC or whatever you want to call it to basically say um, we want to reclaim cities back for people. And I think that's slowly happening uh, and it's an exciting time to be part of that movement. My first uh, comment when I got here was, oh my god, I think this is what Amsterdam was like in the 70s. So, <laughs> so that's a good thing. So there's the energy. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Cornelia. Thank